All right, welcome everybody to Booze Hour Cloud Edition today. I will bring on my guest, Alex Dow, in just a moment. Uh, before I bring him on, just a couple of things. Um, if you have not hit subscribe already, there is a subscribe button that is just below here. You can click that and you'll be able to see all of the content as it comes out here. Um, there is live content every week. So there's a Monday show. There's uh, usually Cloud Edition as a live stream. Actually, the Monday is a live stream now as well. Cloud Edition is a live stream. And then Community Edition is a live stream as well. Everything's live um, with uh, recorded stuff every once in a while, which was a couple weeks ago when I was out in Whistler. And uh, I wasn't too sure about the reliability of internet at the campsite that I was at. So I, I edited that one and uploaded that one, which was a, an amazing feat on itself because the MP4 that I uploaded to YouTube was two gigs in size, but it went up. Um, other things is the uh, all this content is available via podcast as well. So I've uploaded all of this stuff to Google, um, Apple, Google, Spotify. And you'll find those if you look under Booze Hour. It's not called uh, the Daryl and Boo Show on that one because more of it is actually uh, recognizable as the Booze Hour content. Also, there's a technical newsletter that comes out, which is darylandboo.com. And that is a weekly newsletter. Now, folks who have been individually getting emails from Daryl every week with the newsletter that he sends out, which is the same newsletter, those will be converting to monthly. Um, pretty soon. So you'll want to, if you want to get the um, the newsletter in a weekly format, head over to darylandboo.com and sign up on there. And then Daryl uh, will move to a monthly format um, within the, the next few weeks or so. Uh, important to get weekly news. Um, if you're from the world of F5 or have touched any F5 lately, you would know that there is a very serious CVE um that was out and so it's very timely uh, when you're on those newsletters or it's very important that you're on newsletters like this um uh, the one from askf5.com our knowledge base is very important to be on so that you get all of those uh, security advisories as they come out um but it's been an interesting few days uh for me and for a few other vendors as well we're all in uh, uh have some fun times right now um but helping out customers as much as we can so um, without further ado, I will bring on Alex. Hey, Alex, how's it going? Hey, Boo, thanks uh, for having me on again. Uh, yeah, awesome. Hey, you are the first return guest on the live stream so far, if I'm not mistaken. So but it's a different show, isn't it? The, I it was is. doing Community Edition before. It, it is. So, community, so there's only one show left for you to tackle. You know what? There's 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 two more shows. So there's the weekly update. Welcome, or you know, we we'd love to have you on that as well. Um, although we asked, usually on the weekly update, we do a Q and A with the guest, and we ask them a bunch of questions, and that was essentially what we did during Community Edition, anyways. Um, yeah. And then there's a Friday one that we don't really advertise a whole lot, but me and one of my colleagues in Calgary named Kyle McKay, we do an Ask Me Anything on that show, and so far our um, view count is at about like twenty. Or so <laughs> overall, which is um, yeah, which is pretty low. But I don't really, I don't really blast that one out. We just jump on and, and answer questions. And so you're also more than welcome to come on that. And then you've got the not the trifecta, you've got the quadfecta of uh, live streams from this channel. So stream all the things. Stream all the things. Um, so today, this is a special show because we're going to talk about lab stuff. And what's interesting too, so for folks that are on here listening right now, you may have found your way here from the, the various posts that we were making. Um, got a lot of feedback on what other people are doing for their labs as well. So I think this could actually turn into like a bit of a series and we start to compare notes and pros and cons of I'm sure we'll talk about that with your lab, like pros and cons of how you architected yours versus how some of other folks have architected theirs because they had their own ideas. So this this is going to be totally interactive. We talked about how you have some content to share, but a lot of this is going to be discussion on on us uh, between us. Um, and I think we have some listeners uh, as well who will be able to chime in. Uh, we got one listener here, Robin, who said he came here today to get a free guitar. 
There's no free guitars left. We gave out the only free guitar that we had. I don't know if you saw that episode there, um, Alex, but uh, my father-in-law was giving us, us as in me and Daryl and all of our listeners, free guitar lessons. And so he recorded guitar lessons for um, eight weeks, five minutes a piece, because both myself and Daryl have these guitars that we don't know how to play. And so that was... Mm -hmm. That was something that was pointed out. Um, at the end of the eight weeks, we uh, donned on him a guitar um, live on air, which was uh, which was really fun. He's he's a, a great musician, and he um, if you ask him, he probably doesn't have enough guitars. If you ask my mother in law, he has too many guitars, um, so now he's got an extra guitar uh, to add to his collection there. Um, yeah, so we are here to talk about labs today, and this came up because you gave me the idea, actually, because you said that you were, um, last time we were chatting, you said you were off to do a presentation uh, to a group of students about your lab uh, set up at home. So I thought, hey, this would be great to uh, talk about this kind of stuff uh, on a live stream, because I'm sure lots of other people are looking for something to do during COVID if they're not in the office and they have uh, some commute time that they can reclaim into something uh, productive. Shall I uh, uh, give you a little bit of backstory of how this presentation came about? I would love to hear that. Okay. Well, you know, with COVID, you know, team building is hard when you can't do it in person. So we started doing uh, each, each team member had to create a presentation. It didn't have to be about what we do or anything, but um, I said, you know what, I've put a lot of effort into building up infrastructure at home i want to inspire the team to be able to communicate so i was the first one to go so i put together the in the version one of this presentation which was how to ruin your weekends um and it then you know they loved it and then i told a couple of people i was I, I created this presentation i was like hey i'll give you my presentation but i want you to then create a presentation about your lab and, and present it to me um, so it's, it's, there's been quite a few iterations uh, of both my labs as well as some of my friends' labs now that uh, they've been able to present. Uh, and then, you know, helping, helping out the students uh, a few weeks ago, I, I presented. And this, this, uh, this version of it will focus a lot more on the people that may not know where to begin with, with how to create a lab. And we want to tie in that, that whole cliche thing of an entry level job requiring five years of experience. Uh, like, well, how do you get that experience? And I say, roll it yourself. Um, it, it's, uh, it's easy, it's fun, and it will get you the job you want. And it's so funny because I saw uh, somebody posted on LinkedIn the other day that somebody was looking for 12 years of experience with, with Kubernetes when Kubernetes has only existed for six years. <laughs> right. That's what, what is it? What are these HR departments uh, smoking? <laughs> that's uh, that's pretty incredible. Maybe they're gonna aim for like Kelsey Hightower or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Um, that's uh, so it's interesting because you, as founder of a company, you're hiring people. So when you talk to them and you talk about their experience, do you ask about home lab or what they do? You know, outside of nine to five. Oh, absolutely. Um, and in fact, like even when I've been helping clients hire their security team, that's one of the first questions I was like, describe your internet at home. You yeah. know, if it's like, yeah, I got a Linksys, like probably don't want to talk to you because I'm looking for somebody that uh, is making their life more complicated, but for fun and profit. Um, so yeah, it's typically like, well, what do you do after work? Right? Like, do, do you really indulge in this? And I think we've talked about it before is like, our industry moves so fast is like, you don't just go to school for four years and then you're just like, I'm good. I got, I'm in the career now. I can sort of coast. Like we're perpetually learning in this industry. And if you don't have that appetite to learn, this probably isn't the right industry for you. No, no, not whatsoever. Um, yeah. And I remember, you know, when I was going to school at, at BCIT, um, my lab was a lot different than it is now, but you had to physically buy routers. Uh, so I was collecting routers off of eBay and putting in snipe bids where I could to pick up like a 2611 and getting the proper uh, VIC cards and WIC cards for them. Um, but we can get away with a lot less these days. Totally. Yeah, I was an 1811 router fan myself. Oh, yeah. Or no, sorry, it was a 1711. 1711. Yeah. 
Yeah, nice. Yeah, I had a little uh, desktop. So, uh, fun fact, um, now that I've gotten a little bit into AV stuff, I've realized that the 19-inch rack um, that you can use for networking equipment is also used for audio and video equipment. So you could, if you're looking on Craigslist for a rack, you could potentially go uh, check out what AV guys might be hawking uh, on Craigslist and, and you could fit into their racks too. Very good. To, good to know that because uh, telecom stuff even used ain't, ain't cheap. No, no. And it's big. People are usually selling racks. They're selling like big four post racks or, uh, well, I haven't looked for a rack lately, let's be honest. But, um, you know, at the time when I was looking for like even a two post rack, it would be a full 42 U rack, which is not going to fit in my crawl space. Um, but some of the sound gear, because they are, um, taking them to gigs, then they'll actually have like portable cases and they don't necessarily need to be, if you're a network person, you don't necessarily need the length for a server, you need the length for um, a router or a switch. And so sometimes you can actually get away with some of the AV uh, racks out there. So hot tip for everyone. That's my contribution for this conversation. Awesome. I, I, uh, I had definitely looked into the half racks and like the insulated, uh, and soundproof racks as well to have in the house. Mm -hmm. But, uh, I never had a roommate or, a or, or a partner that had the appetite to have something so grotesque in the house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm lucky that we have uh, a crawl space here uh, that I can throw that stuff in um but maybe we can talk about your your stuff first since this okay. show is uh is titled all about alex or uh, whatever title we came up with this uh for, for this one. uh do you want me to bring up your yeah your bring it up here all right cool all right um so hello everyone and uh thanks for joining um you know, I, I love building. Um, I, I'm a geek at heart. And this presentation, as I said, was like sort of a tongue in cheek of when you build your own home labs and you start actually depending on it as production environments, um, uh, things go wrong and your weekends get ruined. But I also wanted to like pull it back to like sort of why, I, why I've been building these things. And first it was because I wanted more hands on experience. School wasn't really doing it for me. But this has really resonated well as I've been hiring people. Is like I, I hire the people that actually geek out after after work after school. So let's get into it. And where's my mouse? Uh, we already have another listener question here. I have a eight Raspberry Pi Kubernetes cluster. It fits in a lunchbox. Do I get an interview? <laughs> I would say yes. That's a that's an awesome use case. Um, and uh, I haven't got that far with, with uh, doing Kubernetes clustering uh, at home. Uh, and I will get into why I didn't do that. Um, mm -hmm. I guess let's roll. Uh, if you don't know me, I'm going to skip through this because there are, are better slides. But uh, uh, I played with computers in the 90s and, and I've been uh, you know, challenging myself ever since. I'll just put it that way. So first question is, why build a home lab? Um, as I mentioned, we are in the industry of perpetual learning. Um, so having a controlled and isolated environment uh, will allow you to do experiments, read a blog, and then replicate it, uh, really experiment with all the things. Uh, also embracing learning and failure. Uh, the lab is a great place to fail uh, so that you don't have to fail in production environments. Um, the second reason I do it is like add more functionality to your network. Like I run, you know, media servers, I've run different, you know, chat apps and games and stuff like that on the at home network, mostly as proof of concept, but you know, the media server serves a, a, a nice circle of friends and family. Um, uh, and you're starting to add enterprise grade features. You can do add Active Directory um, for authentication and whatnot. Uh, and you can start routing your traffic, not out to the Canadian internet, but down to that American internet to get some of that juicy uh, uh, exclusive internet streaming that we don't get up here. Um, and for the students and, and people that are getting into the industry, it's it, like, because it's like this cliche of like, well, you need all this experience for an entry level job that is not gonna ever exist. Um, you need to really be able to show your experience. And my, my story is that uh, right out of school, I had a you know piece of paper on the wall saying I know technology, but 
you know, at the end of the day, I knew it from the books and maybe a couple labs, but not really like the hands on, like what we would actually say is like working in the IT space. But, you know, I had a, a Linksys WRT, uh, they had a hacked firmware, which would turn on different uh, enterprise grade features. And when I got uh, into a job interview, I chatted. It, in fact, the hiring manager was dealing with an incident. So he brought in his like technical person and we just geeked out for an hour. And when the manager finally came back in, um, the, the technical guy was just like, Alex is our guy, hire him. And that's because I was able to say, like it demonstrate that I had a lot of hands-on experience, a lot of experience failing, but then figuring out how to get myself out of it. So, you know, being able to show that you like to learn uh, ability to describe complex systems and triage and troubleshooting. Uh, I remember one of the one of the questions was is like they gave a description of of a problem, and I was like, well, we could look up this and that. He's like, okay, that didn't work. What else? And all they were looking for was that you had a, a mentality of troubleshooting, and you also knew when to like ask for help. Uh, and I think after the third of that didn't work, what else? I would say, all right, I'm going to escalate to uh, my peer. Uh, the lab evolution, as I said, the first one, which would have been early 2000s, was just a Linksys WRT with some hacked firmware, uh, put put some VLANing on it, which was sort of cool. Once I got into my career, um, uh, like you, Boo, I was uh, scouring uh, the Ebays, and it's so funny that you bring up that auction snipe because I was totally using that to get exactly what I wanted. Um, so, you know, I was the, it was cool to do, get the Cisco search back then, so I was doing that. Uh, I had a switch, a router, and then I needed to do some Juniper search, so um, bought some Juniper gear. And then I started uh, running a, a Linux box with a VMware workstation on it, so some virtualization. Um, in 2015, I bought a big, uh, you know, big, relatively speaking, box for a home, put ESXi on it, started virtualizing firewalls, had Windows AD, really building out an enterprise-grade environment made it very highly complex and uh that meant that if that computer went off the entire network went off uh this current generation is like the miniaturized and modernized uh environment um and it's i'm really trying to simplify it make it so that i'm not ruining as many weekends and annoying my wife when the internet goes down you know like uh, the internet is very important these days yeah. um but also saving on the power bill because that big ESXi box was costing me like $45 a month. And, you know, I have friends in Ottawa that, you know, are still very much in the big iron world um, and they have racks. And the only reason they have all that stuff is because they don't pay their power bill. It's included in the rent. Um, <laughs> out here, we all, we pay our power bill. <laughs> um, so, you know, this, this round I've been dabbling with Hyper-V, Docker, doing hybrid cloud, um, and uh, doing lots of open source secure, security suite type technologies. I have a thin client model and uh, dealing microservices. So again, goal, learn something, create something, uh, more functionality in the home network and do it as cheap as I can. So are you, uh, okay. Are you gonna get into your hypervisor choice in one of these slides? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll gripe, I'll gripe a little bit. All okay. right, so if this is your home network, um, probably not going to hire you. Um, <laughs> and, and, that, and mainly because that's a pretty boring network. It doesn't really do much. It just gives you access out to the internet and maybe you have a hacked firmware on there. That is the actually essentially the, uh, the network that I was fiddling with. That was my gen one lab. Um, but that's pretty basic. This is what mine looks like. So I'm in a new building. So, I'll, you know, as, a, as somebody that grew up in the nineties and like was longing for a T1 internet connection of 1.44 megabits, symmetrical. Uh, being able to have a fiber optic connection with a gig is pretty awesome to say the least. Um, so my core is a Sophos XG route, uh, firewall. Uh, that's that little black box in the bottom. It's decent firewalling, uh, weak IDS, but it does some authentication proxying. It has a WAF in it and it, it does uh, uh, land to land as well as uh, inbound VPN, which is pretty nice. Um, not in this picture, but I, I have a Sophos AP that gives me uh, the ability to uh, do like enterprise grade wireless, uh, multiple SSIDs. So, uh, you know, fun experiment, turned on uh, Starbucks Wi-Fi, 
homes and the amount of uh, people walking by my place and their phones were connecting to my network was uh, pretty incredible. I had to turn that off actually because it was uh, it was it was getting bad. Um, really, the the reason I picked Sophos was uh, Sophos XG free for home use, and I was able to pick up um, a Sophos AP for pretty cheap. Um, from a switching perspective, that's that gray box um, on. on on there. That's a TP link. It's a Soho managed switch. So it actually does some cool enterprise grade features um, with, with, with a very cheap price tag. So you can do your trunking and VLANing uh, as well as port mirroring as well, which is really clever. Um, from a compute perspective, uh, I've got two servers. Uh, the archive is a NAS uh, on the bottom and that's a weak seller on, but I, you know, even though they say they only support eight, uh, eight gigs, I was able to determine it supports 16. Um, put a bunch of storage in there. And uh, it does actually run as a hypervisor, but if you've ever bought a, a, a NAS, like a QNAP, like it can, it's got a ton of features. You can only ever turn on one or two of them. Otherwise it, it will fall over. Um, but, you know, really my, my pride and joy, I bought this, uh, like on New Year's Day, I think was the was this little box up top. Uh, and I call that the mothership, um, and that's got an i7 six core. You can actually get an i9. I didn't think I needed that type of horsepower, but I put 32 gigs of RAM in it, uh, 512 of uh, really fast SSD, and then a four terabyte um, spinning disk in that little box. And it's got two NICs, one internal, one. Um, uh, one on the USB-C, uh, and that gives me the ability to connect into my server VLAN and also tap the network for network monitoring. So this is really what my network looks like, and as you can see, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, won't dive too deep into this, but the, it's color-coded based off of zoning. So green is this where the servers are at, and uh, uh, Orange is where the IoT stuff is. So I don't trust anything IoT. So it is isolated. There's a bunch of rules around when when it gets connected to the network. It doesn't get um, uh, it doesn't get out to the internet. It has to be sort of permitted out uh, and whatnot. Uh, and then you know wireless is both for users and IoT, different VLANs and whatnot. Um, the dotted lines are uh, network tap. So I got one set up on uh, switch two, uh, which is where most of the traffic flows through. But I do want to run. Um, a second tap connection. Uh, the limitation there is I don't really want network cables zipping around my house. So I'm actually going to use a Mocha connection and use um, the coaxial cable in my walls, which is a pretty cool thing. Um, mm. So yeah, that's, that's, that's the network. And you can see that there's lots of things running on there. I got camera controllers, smart lights. Um, I was telling telling Boo about uh, my indoor farm. I'm growing currently cilantro, lettuce, and basil. Um, and that is uh, monitored. It's got like a little Raspberry Pi that's taking photos of it, uh, managing the lights going on and off, watering, etc. cetera, um, internet, all the things. Uh, any questions on that or should I just keep going? Uh, can you, what was the Mocha thing that you mentioned? I hadn't come across that. So Mocha is, you know, like there's like ethernet over power lines or power over ethernet or something like that. P yeah. Um, yeah, uh, it sucks. I've used it. It's not great. Mocha, on the other hand, uses essentially it's a media converter from Cat Cat Five or Cat Six to uh, coaxial and then back. So you can get gigabit Ethernet uh, over your existing coaxial through your wall. So if you if you sign up for Telus, they'll land um, their fiber or their DSL right like at the best connection, and then they may actually use Mocha to to for like the last not mile i guess meter yeah. last couple of meters to get to where you want your uh, internet to be so it's sort of cool if you have coaxial in your wall you can now put gigabit through your wall as well and it works cool. way better than uh ethernet over power line for sure cool and and the their adapter is about 80 bucks on craigslist right now all right so how, yeah for each endpoint so you do need two of them um, but a lot of the TELUS modems will actually have a Mocha connection um, in there. That's how I actually found out about it. Um, but I didn't use the TELUS modem. That modem is in a drawer somewhere. <laughs> um, so let's talk about the, the components. So for those that aren't familiar what virtualization is, it's the ability to run more, more than one operating system on a piece of hardware. Uh, it is essentially sharing 
slices of the CPU, RAM, storage, network, et cetera. What's cool is you can start doing rapid templating. So you can spin up like five of the same server um, and, and you know rapidly provision that stuff. It's pretty much what the cloud's built on. It's The software behind it is what we call a hypervisor. Um, so that's really the software that sits between the hardware and the virtual operating systems. And it presents virtual hardware for the most part to the virtual, uh, the virtualized guest operating system. Though some of the more advanced uh, hypervisors will actually provide like a direct connection to the graphics card. Um, they also do virtual networking. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't go as far as to say that most do software defined networking, but in that sort of category where you can actually start creating um, virtual networks. And that's in, in the last generation lab, I virtualized the firewall and it was able to do all that routing with all the different VMs, all without ever leaving that box. The other thing that I, I really got into this this round was containerization. So it's like the best way to describe it is like it's the virtualization of apps. Uh, and what it does is it's isolating each application from it, itself and even parts of the OS. Uh, but it will share common pieces, the kernel, some libraries, et cetera. The application feels like it's totally alone. It's only uh, it's the only app on the server, but you can uh, do networking in between the apps and whatnot. There's fairly uh, good good capabilities with the networking. Um, so why did I go with containerization? Well, first, all the cool kids are doing it. So I wanted to learn, right? Um, I, I had heard about what this was. I listened to an awesome podcast about microservices from uh, the guys who were at Netflix a few years back. And I was like, all right, I got to try this out. Why it's really cool is it allows you to try a lot of open source projects really quickly without having to like build a new server, install the dependencies, install the app. Um, but quite frankly, the reason was, is I was running all these like media servers and download servers and whatnot, and you update one of those and it just kills all the other ones. I'm talking about you, Python. Um, <laughs> and it would then ruin my weekend rebuilding all, all the things. And that's because, you know, reverting and rebuilding Linux sucks and containerization allows you to like really keep the host operating system fairly uh, isolated from the chaos of installing and, and, and deleting apps. And containerization really en enables the concepts of ephemeral systems. Um, it, it allows for the ability to, when something doesn't work, just delete it and reinstall, like reinstall it within a second or two, and it's back up and running. Whereas like, you just don't do that with traditional infrastructure. And since the world is going into this containerization, um, of, of IT, not just applications. It's it's really worth being uh, well versed in it. Um, so this is the mothership. This is the the back end of it. It actually does come with a wireless card as well, which was pretty clever. So I wanted to really just deep dive deep into how it, it was built. Um, so first, I put Windows 10 as the core OS. That's because I did want to actually have a desktop as well, um, mm -hmm. and this was the best way to do so. I will say though that Windows 10 is uh, quite pedantic with, uh, you know, it's it's still supposed to be a user-based computer. So, you know, they really are, are forcing you to apply patches. And while I do subscribe to the patch all the things, I sort of want to do it on my own terms. And Windows 10 uh, just keeps on reverting the changes back, uh, which is frustrating because it, it sometimes will reboot on you and, and you didn't know. Um, if you have Windows 10 Professional, you get Hyper-V for free, which is uh, uh, Microsoft's attempt at getting into the uh, virtualization world. Uh, it is definitely popular. I don't necessarily think it's as mature as uh, the VMware suite, but um, it is there. Um, and then on top of that, I've got uh, three servers right now. And when I have time, I'm going to get uh, the other Elastic Sim installed on there. But I've got a Docker node, Docker node 2. Docker node one is sitting on um, uh, the uh, the archive server. I've got Kali, and then I've got Security Onion. Now, what's interesting is on Docker node two, we then have all these little containers. So I've got Portainer, which is a management interface for uh, Docker, Pihole, which I'll get to in a moment, uh, Sumo Logic, send some logs out to the cloud, Radar Sonar, NZB to abide by all copyright laws, um, and uh, MB to stream. Uh, uh, free use media. Uh, also, I, uh, I really like using our desktop. It's a super light Linux desktop if you just need a desktop. And I'm going to throw Let's Encrypt on soon just to 
you know, eat my own, my own dog food on, on cert management. So, but you can see that all of this is in that little box. Uh, and that little box still hums at probably only about 20, 30% CPU, unless uh, security onions going a little crazy. So let's start talking about how to build uh, your own home lab. So step one is gonna be getting some hardware. And this is obviously the, the most important part um, to do it the cheapest way or the most performance driven way. And, and, you know, like chatting to a few people on LinkedIn about this talk, like we're already talking about what they're doing and like, awesome. Right. And like, it, it's, it's a choose your own adventure. If you want to really get into, you know, big metal uh, networking equipment or, or, or bigger servers. Um, for me, I had sort of gone that route. Power bill is pretty ridiculous. Um, so I actually wanted to see like, what could I do in the littlest box as possible and keep my power under $10 a month. But just if you're starting out, and again, this is the idea of just have something to have experience on is you could use a desktop or a laptop. You want to have a CPU with multiple cores uh, with, a, with what they call the virtualization extension. Um, as long as your CPU is like under 10 years, you should have that. Uh, RAM is by far the most important piece of a virtualization environment, uh, mainly because if you're running Windows 10 and you put Hyper-V on and you only have eight gigs, that Windows 10 really wants eight gigs. Uh, so it's gonna be sharing that eight gigs with virtual other like guest operating systems. And it'll be doing tons of swapping and you're gonna have a major bottleneck there. Um, I personally suggest 16 at the bare minimum. Uh, so that means you could run an, a main OS and maybe one, uh, one to two small ones and be always happy with performance. Um, but, you know, in enterprise grade worlds, like they we're talking, they, they do like terabytes of RAM these days. So, you know, keep that in perspective when, when you're spinning up how many servers from a storage perspective, you want some fast storage for the operating systems. But if you're like, say, building a, a, a SIM, you want to like be able to have cheaper, slower storage, uh, like, and that's, that's sort of, a good balance of having OS on fast storage and the storage stuff. Uh, USB dongles for uh, Ethernet and wireless might be useful. Um, so, you know, existing hardware could be your current PC or old PC. I would recommend using something that you're not primarily using because this whole idea is that it should not always work as well. Um, and you don't want to be interrupting uh, at anyone else's usage of the internet or the network. The next step is, is the refurbish. And that was my last generation was getting a, an off lease um, refurbished uh, workstation. And, and this screenshot at, at the bottom is a, an example of that. Um, there's a company out of Toronto called uh, Canada Monitors. And you can see for under $700, you can get 12 core Xeon, uh, 24 gigs of RAM, which is all right. I'd be upgrading that. But like most of the other components are pretty tip top on that. And while it's like years old for like your purpose of like spinning up a bunch of VMs and stuff, it's going to be excellent and like i i bought like a, a last generation version of that and i had it was a dual it was dual quad core xeons it came with 32 i ended up bumping up to 128 gigs of ram like it was it was a beefy system mm -hmm. um also found a quad uh gig port uh yeah, card uh like a big network card that had four ports in it that was really cool thank you ebay uh, the other options, again, you can buy new. Uh, any of the gaming rigs would have tons of horsepower for this type of stuff. You don't really need a GPU unless you have a specific use case for it, like if you're uh, trying to crack passwords or whatnot, but you're going to pay for all that. So again, cheapest to most expensive, those are some of the options. Um, step two is setting up that environment. So first, getting that hypervisor going. I wouldn't recommend not doing a hypervisor because that just means you're going to have a bigger power bill. Um, so two things to take into consideration, uh, type one and type two hypervisors. So the type ones are, uh, very good for always on labs. Um, but they can be a little bit more pedantic to use a little more pedantic with hardware where type two, um, is typically something that's sitting on top of the operating system, uh, less performance with type two, because it's not directly talking to the hardware, it's still going through the operating system to talk to hardware. But again, performance, again, I'm surprisingly hyper v even though it's sitting on windows 10 it's actually windows 10 that's sitting on hyper v um which was really fascinating to me because i thought it was would have been totally a type 2 hypervisor but it is not um so i really like esxi uh it's free to start out with it's just a little pedantic with the network cards you got to get uh, 
a very specific network card is is typically the hardware that will not be compatible. So it's got to be an Intel based chipset for the most part. Um, and then, you know, if you're if you're going to go type two, I would say VirtualBox because it's free. VMware is a pay pay uh, pay to play. Uh, uh, hypervisor. Uh, containerization, Docker is is the quickest path to uh, starting to play with containers. Um, and you would install it on a Linux server, also known as a node. Um, you would have one node and that's like, that's pretty normal if for a lab environment just to have one node, unless you're trying to really experiment with the uh, orchestration side of uh, containerization. But a cluster would be a uh, more than one node that would work together and distribute load and, and whatnot. Um, you will want to get familiar with the CI, CLI at a minimum, um, but I will say that there is a pretty pretty decent uh, uh, front end called Portainer that I use. Um, you may want to like again if you are looking at like learning Kubernetes, Minikube is is good. I've played, I, I, I've used that as well. Um, it is limited to a single host in. Um, uh, or a single node in, in cluster essentially. So like it's a bit limit, limiting, but it, like it's sort of turnkey out of the box. Uh, moving on, let's talk about operating systems. So you know, I like to virtualize a desktop. It allows you to have a place that isn't your own, your personal laptop to like install software, experiment, and like it's also nice because you can just sort of like close it, and then when you log back in, all your dashboards are still up and running. That's just me uh, spinning up more than one Linux server at a minimum. Uh, last, I don't I do not do this anymore, but the last version of my lab, I had Windows AD in there. That was mostly because, again, what I was doing with, uh, with my day job, I needed to have a lot of experience in AD. Uh, that, that was required. One thing I think that's really cool, I haven't done it yet, but uh, a friend's lab is built on, is called Unraid. And it is, uh, it's a sort of a, a software, version of a NAS software, and it can actually do the hypervising and stuff. It's pretty much like the QNAP, but you just supply your own hardware. You do pay for it, but it is, uh, it's pretty clever. I really, I, I, I got the tour and I, I would definitely recommend looking at Unraid. You can put in VMs, you can also run containers through it, and it acts as a file server, et cetera. Um, lastly, when we're talking about containerized apps, the path of least resistance is going to Docker Hub. It's a public registry of all the, um, all, all the, the majority of, of open source projects out there. Um, so it's it's essentially a pre-built uh, image for you to just pull down and, and set up, but tread carefully because um, Docker Hub is just full of garbage apps, uh, insecure apps, apps that are have little phone home telemetry things in there. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be putting this in a corporate production environment, but if, if you want to try a software, Docker node's good. But at the end of the day, you should be learning how to construct your own containers. Um, and your this lab will allow you to do so. Uh, next, networking. So um, you, you want a firewall. That gives you the ability to uh, do routing and network segmentation. You can virtualize that, as I have, or you can put it on an older PC. Just need two NICs, uh, NIC cards, uh, of course. Um, and I use Sophos S uh, XG, it was free, free for 50 IPs, which surprisingly I'm getting pretty close to uh, topping out at. Um, PFSense is sort of like the uh, open source firewall out there. It's pretty good. Uh, again, if I didn't have, you know, uh, the deal with Sophos, I probably would have gone PFSense. And I haven't played with it, but I've seen Untangle Firewall is pretty cool as well. I think it's free-ish, and then you pay for like some subscription service to it. Uh, from the switching, again, you can totally virtualize this, but if you want to like expand your use cases out to network segmentation and network sniffing, you'll need a, a switch. And here's one for 45 bucks, eight port. It can do VLANing, but it also can do that port mirroring, which is uh, really clever for uh, the monitoring use cases. So let's talk about those use cases. First one, network security. Um, again, I, I worked in a SOC for many years and always you know, it lots of change control. So there wasn't a, a, a real environment for me to really experiment in. So by having my own firewall, I was able to really play around and that gives you an opportunity to do network segmentation, access control, uh, pranking your roommates or partners, uh, web content filtering to keep the bad stuff out. Um, 
intrusion detection, you know, though I would argue that most of these like UTMs don't really have the oomph when it comes to the really full blown network detection, uh, threat detection capabilities. Um, but yeah, network visibility, really seeing what's traveling in and out of your network through the logs, through the dashboards of the firewall, really useful. And of course, having VPNs is nice. Um, so you can be abroad, dial in uh, or connect into your uh, home network and have access to all your resources. Next is, you know, test all the flavors of Linux. Uh, probably don't do that. That's probably, you know, a, a lot more work than uh, than it should be. But, you know, in reality, there are quite a few differences. Uh, I grew up with Red Hat because that's like what, what school taught us. Uh, so I have stuck with CentOS for that server side and Amazon Linux is also based off of that. So, you know, the path is, is good, but from a desktop experience, like I, I, I think Ubuntu and Kubuntu are, are really decent um, desktops, um, but really it's a, it's a matter of really getting to know the differences between uh, essentially the Debian and the Red Hat backends um, and the, the different commands and, and whatnot. Um, it's good to have both because there's not one project I've been on where it's like, no, we only use CentOS. It's always going to be a mixture because there's just different regimes. Um, next, build a red teaming VM. So, you know, most people have probably heard of Kali, uh, the ethical hacker OS. So it's full of security testing tools, lots of online training, uh, free and, and not free. Uh, it's fairly easy to install. It's Ubuntu based, and that's going to be a great foundation for attacking your network and then being able to see what, how that attack worked. And I think that's really important. Um, then once you've built the red team, you got to build the blue team. Security Onion is one of the better uh, uh, network monitoring solutions out there. Um, it is a bunch of pre-built tools in there, uh, network intrusion, host intrusion, uh, log monitoring, and it does packet capture. So what like one use case I do is like with the IoT is like I can see exactly what IoT devices are phoning home. And then I can like look at, um, you know, why, you know, why are they phoning home? Like what frequency is that? Is that every time I say a keyword, do they like phone home? Like you can do that with these types of things. Um, you will need a network tap uh, to really get the power out of this because it's relying so heavily on uh, Zeek packet capture data, um, but it's it's pretty cool. It's it's essentially the sim I, I, I run at home uh, uh, on a, a daily basis now. And then five is run cool services at home. You know, the internet is full of cool services, some that are gonna be useful for cybersecurity, some that'll be useful for keeping you entertained, et cetera. Um, the three that I thought were really cool is Pi-hole, which I put in uh, late last year. Uh, it's a DNS firewall, so it will see the DNS lookups. It has a, 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 a blacklist of all the um, uh, advertisers, spammers, privacy invaders. Uh, all of those domains are blocked by default, so all of a sudden your internet is clean and, and happy again. Uh, but it's got some really great dashboards. The, uh, uh, the first two uh, screenshots show the dashboards of like the activity and DNS is so critical to any network, uh, but it also show who like what domains are being blocked the most. Microsoft, like wow, you know, Windows servers are leaking a ton of telemetry data, um, but it also identify which clients are are um, uh, leaking the most. So I'm pretty sure that's my wife's iPhone and all the Instagram and maybe even some TikTok. Um, Home assistant's really cool. So again, for me, I'm a little bit paranoid, even though I do have IoT, I really put a lot of wrappers around it. Home assistant allows you to take over a lot of those IoT devices without them having to reach out to the cloud. Uh, so it's pretty cool. I'm just playing around with that right now. Uh, that's that screenshot on the hard right. Um, and it is, it's pretty cool, a uh, really good open source project. And then lastly, VPN hub. So, um, Sadly, the uh, Sophos XG was not compatible with this, so I had to spin up a Docker to do so. But essentially, you can land all these VPNs to the US and to Europe and whatnot, and then you just have separate VLANs that uh, that bind to the, those um, uh, those VPNs. So you just have your version of your wireless network dash America. And now all of a sudden, if you connect to that, you are in America and you're able to stream all the things. Um, very useful, make your... Uh, 
uh, roommates uh, and partners very happy. Um, so, you know, as I said, it's all about, you know, ruining your weekend. So this was the most uh, recent uh, catastrophic failure I have had. Um, so um, I have Pi-hole running on two uh, different separate servers. And the reason for that is that DNS is so critical that we don't want to just rely on one server to do so. So primarily it's on the mothership and then secondarily it's on the archive server. Um, Archive is running on QNAP. Uh, one of my colleagues said, hey, you run a QNAP. There's a huge vulnerability that you should patch right now. And I'm like, oh, I, I better do that right away. So I did. And with QNAP, you need to reboot every time you do anything. So that went down. Now, Mothership, you know, let me back up. Mothership stores most of its data onto Archive. And that whole idea of of these like uh, microservices is that the application can spin up on almost anywhere, but the, uh, the, the data, the persistent data is stored centrally on a NAS or a SAN or whatever. So that I'm trying to do the, replicate that. But when I rebooted the NAS, all of a sudden where all the data is being written to that drop, that NFS share dropped. Um, and eventually pie hole fails. And now I have no DNS going uh, on at all, but my primary and secondary fail. And then the users are incredibly unhappy. And it made it a bit worse because when the QNAP came back up, it was looking to resolve from one, one of two pie holes, which none were online, and it couldn't fully boot up because it was waiting to um, get an, uh, you know, an update or something like that. So that took my network down for a good couple hours um, and unbeknownst to me, like I, I rebooted that and then left the house and then get a call from my wife saying uh, the Internet's not working. The, the, the most dreaded call of the lab manager. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So to wrap up, uh, bigger is not always better. Um, uh, like, again, I've loved playing with big metal um, in the lab. I had that 120 gigs was awesome. Um, with like separate three com switch and all that stuff, but it does add a la layer of complication. So best to start off small, isolated, uh, it, parallel to your home network, um, because fiddling with DNS or DHCP, which is uh, fun and also useful for some of these use cases, uh, do increase the likelihood of trouble tickets being submitted in, in inappropriate times. Um, experimenting with those hacking tools is fun, but it can bring bad stuff into your network. Also you need to target stuff in your own network. If you start using those tools out on the internet, you uh, could be breaking laws, which is not that good. YouTube and Reddit's NetSec are great resources. And don't forget to have fun and fail. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, Alex. Um, your last point there, having fun and failing, <clears throat> something that I've done numerous times in my own lab, so I can attest to that. Those are the times where you learn the most about a lot of stuff. I mean, at work when things fail at work and then also at home when things fail at home. It's almost a toss up, like you said, like what becomes higher, like a bigger urgency, um, your wife and your kids not being able to get to Netflix or a SEV1 outage at work. Um, I think they're both the same. P1, <laughs> SEV1. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Going to open it up for questions too. We got about ten minutes or so um, that we've got booked for this. So anybody who's got any comments, please throw them into the YouTube chat, and we'll be able to bring them up on here. But that was that was awesome. Um, like I was saying, I'm looking at. I was saying this in my own uh, LinkedIn post that I'm looking at making some changes in my own lab. So we'll see where I go. I have pretty similar to you, I'd say my. Um, I actually have shut down my hypervisors at this point. So I had two ESX servers and uh, recently I was thinking about turning them back on, but I, I've left them off for now. My, uh, But I have a lot of stuff that runs on an old laptop, running Linux, running Docker, running Portainer, and you can just go grab whatever you need off of Docker Hub, assuming that you've um, checked out to make sure it's safe. Um, and then I keep my... Uh, configs on an NFS share coming off of uh, one of my two NASs. Um, oh, man. Oh, very similar setup. I go here. Any suggestions on running honeypots? How do you feel about that, running a honeypot in your home lab? Uh, uh, yeah, like I, I think, like again, doing it in a controlled fashion. I think that actually brings up, uh, maybe I'll segue for a second, is like building a home lab is great. However, like let's not 
let's not forget that where the world is going in terms of compute is not on the hardware, it's all in the cloud. So that might be a good opportunity to do a hybrid approach where um, running a, a SIM or security onion is very CPU and, and RAM intensive. So it's not very cost effective uh, to run that in the cloud if you're paying for it yourself, but running the SIM part on your own hardware and running the HoneyNet or HoneyPot out on the internet uh, likely will a give you a lot better isolation um, and b like manage your costs accordingly. Um, I will say that the honeypot that I was uh, I, I really enjoyed using, but I, I think it's been deprecated was the modern honeypot network. It was uh, developed by a company called ThreatStream, and they just simplified rolling out a lot of the honey honeypot uh, components and then uh, aggregating the the uh, detections uh, into a stream that was to feed their threat intelligence service. Um, but, you know, I, as long as you're confident with your networking, you know, by all means, um, you can set one up. I guess the only other consequence I would say is that you could attract more attention that you want. Uh, that's going to then annoy your ISP, especially if you're on, you know, a circuit that is maybe shared like coaxial where like if, if you're getting DOSed your, or DDoSed, your, your neighbors are likely experiencing that too. Um, and again, a lot of ISPs discourage the whole running servers anyways. So, uh, but I wouldn't say don't do it. I would just be, make sure that you're very confident with how your network is isolated. Yeah, cool. Good question too. Um, one of uh, one of the guys I was talking to um, probably about a year ago, he suggested OVH as a cloud provider for that. Um, and you'll notice anybody. I mean, just because I see some of this stuff in threat feeds from F5, OVH uh, becomes the source of a lot of uh, attacks as well because they have uh, free and ubiquitous service. Well, very cheap and ubiquitous services uh, out there that people can do fun stuff with. So, they've got ESXi as a service, which is great. Um, uh, Mars had uh, their email hosted on there for a long time, and we were just like, "Why are we constantly on sp spam lists?" It's because <laughs> it's OVH. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they had uh, the reason why I got on it. They had like a Black Friday deal where you. Uh, I think it was only for one year or so, but you would get like a, a four gig VM, uh, Linux VM for like a uh, dollar a month or something like that. After that, it was, it wasn't even that much more after that. It was like five or six bucks uh, a month after that. But yeah, as long um, as you yeah. uh, don't care about IP reputation, it's, it's, it's really cheap compute for sure. Yeah. Just don't send, don't think that sending an email through that, that IP space is going to be successful. Yeah. <laughs> Do, so um, do you have anything running in public cloud now then that you would consider part of your home lab or you consider that part of like client testing type stuff? Or? Yeah. So uh, um, again, most of my training is on AWS, but I am getting um, more hands on with Azure. Uh, use cases I have right now um, with the NAS, I, they do something called like cloud raid. So I can, you know, it's very similar to like a, a Dropbox or OneDrive where you, it, it will replicate all your files to a, a cloud store and keep the ones that you actually do access um, on on the actual NAS. So I've been doing that more and more. Like on the NAS, I have tiered um, tiered storage based off of its criticality, sensitivity, uh, et cetera. And I use, um, oh, what is it called? Not guacamole, that's the RDP. Um, Wasabi, uh, Wasabi as uh, my, my data store. And uh, it's cheap. It's like five bucks for a terabyte uh, of of data, and uh, it's pretty fast. Like uh, again, you know, if you're storing gig files, it'll take a minute to pull back down. But that's sort of cool. And uh, the NAS will make a decision on what it keeps on the NAS. Um, so again, if you're if you're looking for storage, you can do the same thing with S3 and uh, AWS Glacier. Um, from a compute perspective, uh, most again, I use cloud to spin it up when I need it. Um, and I've, you know, one of the projects I was playing with, uh, lately was Jits, Jitsi, which is, uh, uh, open source for, uh, teleconferencing s solution. Uh, so I was using AWS, uh, Fargate to, uh, spin up those containers when I need them and then spin them down when I don't need them. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Um, 
Here we go. A couple more comments here. You can use WireGuard to proxy external traffic into your local low lab network to avoid attracting attention. At least that's what I think. Uh, from a disposal of VPS. Well, you know, it's funny. Like, so I'm I'm not familiar with WireGuard per se, but you know, before VPNs were cool, um, just when Netflix came out, and like. 2009 I, I i was like i want to get american netflix i'm so annoyed that us canadians are deprived with such low-end content uh, and that's why I, I learned about vps's which were just some other geek that bought a big box and is now renting out little slices oversubscribing little slices of vms and that's where i started setting up uh open vpn servers and then routing my traffic down that way um so yeah they were like five bucks for you know, five, twelve meg and whatnot. It was great. I ended up uh, because I was also playing games at the time. I didn't want my gaming traffic to be routed down in the, into the states. So I ended up reading about people using Twitter as a as a botnet con uh, command and control. So I was like, well, that's easy. That, I'm going to totally do that. Uh, and I was using Twitter. So I what I you know I didn't want to like have to log into my computer and then SSH into the server and say change the routing to Canada. So I ended up just creating a, a, a very simple command and control through uh, Python's uh, Twitter uh, module to uh, listen to my account. And whenever I say a certain command, it would then make the routing change and then respond back, your, your routing north or south. And it worked out really good until I told somebody about that. And then they started tweeting those commands at me. And uh, I'm not a developer. Did I say that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, nice. Very cool. All righty. Again, any uh, questions, you guys can fire them in. Um, I think what will be interesting, too, there's there's a few folks who responded on there um, on my posts about this, talking about ephemeral labs um, and how, you know, if you do it properly, uh, you could have lab space that spins up, spins down, and your cost is like five bucks a month. Um, by the time you do it now, um, doesn't bode well for things like logging where you want to have something, uh, there to be, uh, to receive stuff. But, uh, for certain scenarios that could be handy as well. Um, we did have, um, HashiCorp on a few weeks back. Um, so Terraform would be a tool, uh, that we could use for that. And, uh, I'm due to actually have, uh, Sam from HashiCorp back on. So that will be a great, uh, great topic as well. I will say before we wrap up, um, there was somebody that on LinkedIn was commenting. So, um, you know, they're obviously big into networking and, and they've built out like, you know, they should come on this show and, and talk about their uh, approach. Like for me, um, networking isn't my focus. So I've tried to make it as simple as possible. But for somebody that is, is either wanting to get into the industry or in the industry and wants to accelerate their expertise it is about going on ebay buying that old equipment or again in you know in this future world of 2020 is you know have a hypervisor and get those f5 boxes that can be virtualized so that you get a familiarity with those systems um that that's i i like i have learned so much more from being able to either borrow some hardware uh, download some software or whatnot than I could ever do in school. School is great for that foundation, but um, you know when I was chatting with that person, like they were describing their network, like, okay, that's that's a big enterprise grade network. That power bill must be incredible. <laughs> um, but you know that like I can only imagine that person's level of expertise now because of what they've done, what they've set up um, in their own home. Yeah, and I think I know who you're talking about. And that is a scenario, too, um, where that person's gone through the old stuff. Um, or I would assume they've gone through the old stuff. They're a, a veteran, and so they've done that. So they've got those chops, and then they're building you know, the next uh, piece from there. So that's everybody's at different levels. And, uh, uh, yeah, it is. It, it would be interesting to see what his power bill is like. Um, and also, it's a great point in that different labs are meant for different setups, totally. Like having an ephemeral cloud-based lab, that might just be for uh, some basic development or maybe some basic use cases where um, it doesn't have to do with anything having to have um, 
uh, log analysis that has to happen because, and you're collecting logs all the time, or you have a honeypot out there. So um, I think there's lots of lots of different ways that you can slice this up. Um, cool. Any f uh, parting words, Alex? Maybe we should have like a big powwow uh, and, and uh, debate all the lab things uh, one of these days. But uh, I've just been trying to light a fire under all our fellow geeks about talking what they do uh, at home. And again, a good friend of mine in Ottawa, um, again, he works uh, works uh, in the government, so Big Iron is still his thing. But you know, he has a beautiful environment, very well documented. Because again, that's part of it, right? It's like, you sure you can build it, can you document it? Because that yeah. is something that us geeks do not do very, very well. Um, but you know, he has in in his rack, he has a one U tray that comes out, and it's actually just a bunch of Raspberry Pis that are all interconnected. Uh, I thought that was really cool. He obviously found some manufacturer that makes that, but now he he essentially has a Raspberry Pi cluster. Now, again, in my opinion, I think you should learn about containerization because he probably not need a, a rack of Raspberry Pis. But like that's what he's doing. He's he's raspberry pieing all his applications um but you know it, it it you know he has a a really awesome setup obviously redundant ba battery backups um mm -hmm. dual nas etc like you know to each their own right and like i've gone through my journey uh, and I, i've tried to get as much oomph out of my network without having as much hardware uh as as possible and my, my current setup is pretty stable uh, I'm pretty happy with it. I might change Windows 10 out for ESX. So I might go back <laughs> if that little piece of hardware can handle it. Yeah, cool. Fair enough. Um, well, thank you for jumping on, Alex. I will, my final words for everybody who's stuck it out uh, to the end here is that leave a comment with what you are running in your lab or any questions that you have around what you're considering purchasing for your lab. And I think there's enough people that are kind of, have their eye on this right now that we can contribute to a healthy discussion. I think we need like a, everybody jump on the Mars Slack channel maybe, and then you can, we can have a lab chat on there. Um, I think in the future, I have a couple targets then. If anybody listening right now is actually, well, I know a couple of people that I'll ask, but uh, an ephemeral cloud lab, that'd be awesome. And I'd love to talk about what a Raspberry Pi lab is gonna look like and what you would actually run in a Raspberry Pi lab because, um, I've, I've run Docker on um, Pi before, but it didn't quite have all of the things I needed. Um, so I still needed some x86 uh, in my life. But uh, yeah, that'd be a good discussion. Cool. All right. Thanks, Alex. Um, we will uh, we will see when we can get you on the weekly update, and then uh, you can complete the quadfecta of uh, of live streams on our channel. All right. <laughs> Thanks for having me, and uh, I'm glad to share my. My, my geek environment. I'm looking forward to hearing about others because uh, I think we can all learn off of each other as well. Totally. Awesome. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Um, I'll roll the outro now, but if you haven't subscribed already, hit subscribe. It's actually below Alex uh, over there. If you're listening to the podcast format, hit subscribe on there as well. And if you haven't signed up for the newsletter, you'll get weekly technical updates on there. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for checking this out today. If you're watching via YouTube right now, go ahead and click subscribe down below. Also click the bell for notifications. That way you will find out when we are dropping a new video or when we're going live. Also, there's darylandboo.com. If you head over to that, leave your name and email address. We will drop a weekly technical newsletter in your inbox every Monday. Also, this is available via podcast, Apple, Google, Spotify. Head over to one of those, hit subscribe, and you'll be able to listen to us in the car on your commute or during a walk or a run. Thank you very much, and we will see you next time.